What's up, everybody, and welcome to Rappin' with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer, and every week I uh, interview a person in the reef keeping community. And today I welcome aquarium lighting expert Tulio Delaquila from Reef Bright. Tulio is one of the most knowledgeable people in the aquarium industry when it comes to lighting a reef tank. And I do believe he could talk for hours. <laughs> <laughs> about it, but of course we're not going to give him that opportunity tonight, right, uh, Tulio? But uh, yeah, we'll but uh, seriously, um, you know, Tulio has been a speaker in many industry trade shows about lighting. So really, it is my pleasure and honor to be uh, welcoming Tulio. Tulio, welcome to the show. Hey, Keith, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Remind me to send you that twenty bucks <laughs> I owe you. So, I won't forget. Yeah, and and. Uh, uh, it's funny, I'm, I'm, I'm often referred to as, you know, a guru, an expert. You know, at the end of the day, Keith, I'm just a reefer. You know what I mean? I'm just a reefer. And I guess where I get my experience from is I've been doing it for over two decades, you know. And uh, as you know, I've manufactured lighting for some of the top companies in our industry, designed, manufactured, all types of lighting, whether it's metal halide, T5, LEDs and things like that. And also have I, uh, I've had to deal with a lot of different applications. I've had to deal with a lot of different applications. So those those decades of, 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 of kind of on hands experience, if you will, I get to see both sides of the spectrum, meaning from the design and the manufacturer side and from the utilization side. Now, unfortunately, and, and you've been around uh, pretty much as long as I have, yeah. uh, maybe even longer, um, as you know, lighting has kind of been one of these things like that's that's always been this mysterious thing we're chasing. It's out there in the ether. There's all these different claims. This week, you know, this is 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 the top thing. And then next week, it's something else. And it just always seems to almost be like this moving, evolving target. Um, that's actually quite unnecessary because when we get into what I call the science of light, if you really think about it, the needs of the corals have not changed in millennia. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so the needs of the corals haven't changed. The photon itself has not changed. 
Um, and in terms of our understanding of light, for example, when you look at anything like the Hubble Space Telescope and so many different applications where light is utilized for its precision, OK, when we can tell what a planet is doing millions of light years away by the light that's being emitted, understanding what's happening in a few feet of water and that few feet could even be 40, 50 feet, what have you. But we do understand what happens to light in these varying conditions and what goes on. Unfortunately, in the aquarium industry, to be quite frank, either they haven't gotten a lot of those memos <laughs> or the hype kind of takes over the fact. And, 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 and so it, it, it really all gets kind of uh, jumbled up and, 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 and mixed up, if you will. So what I'd like to do this evening is, uh, instead of talking about the same old, same old, meaning people talk about PAR, they talk about PER, uh, daily light integrals, and we can discuss that. If anybody has any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer your questions on that. But you know what? That's the same old, same old repackaged information, if you will. Um, that's not what I do. So, so here's the thing, Kath, Keith, I'll direct the question to you because, again, you've been reef keeping for a while. If you really think about it, what is light? I mean, what is it? We talk about watts. We talk about Kelvin. We talk about all these different things. But it doesn't really tell us what light actually is. And that's where people have that kind of misunderstanding, if you will. So in short, light is energy, period. OK, these corals, OK, they they it's all about uh, uh, when it comes down to energy, for example, it's all about the delivery. It's all about the utilization of the energy. Right. And it's all about the distribution of that energy. Now, corals. They're actually pretty smart, even though they don't have a brain, they conserve energy. They're a, they are adaptive to their environments. They will adapt to many different lighting environments and things like this. So now if we jump back to the aquarium lighting, if you will, we constantly talk in terms of colors, right? Uh, one of my little pet peeves is when we use terms like color spectrum. Um, because that's actually an oxymoron if you think about it. Because if we were to talk about colors, we're talking about shades. Well, shades aren't colors, but my point is we're talking in terms of you. Uh, there is color science. That's like a separate thing. But spectrum, basically spectrum in short, it's a range. You, you, w w when you use the, the word spectrum, you're talking about a range. So, for example, with lighting and corals, we're talking about anything from, let's say, uh, uh, well, minimally you have 400 to 700 nanometers, obviously, but you have beyond that. You have into the UV, you have into your far red and things like that. So my point I've always told the people, uh, said to people, and I've always said this in my lighting talks as well, Keith, you're a pretty intelligent guy. Can you give me a term? Can you give me a term that can describe 400 things simultaneously happening at once. I can, I can no, cannot. You, you cannot. And that's what's happening with light. So even if we just, even if we just took that bandwidth of 400 nanometers, you have 400 things going on at once when corals are receiving light in the wild, you know, in the wild, for example. Um, other things like, you know, light settings and, you know, I hear things about perfect light settings and all of these other things. Um, there's another kind of oxymoron, if you will, because quite frankly, Keith, as you know, many corals respond to light differently. Now, not only do you have the response or what I would call the, the utilization aspect of that energy, but then you also have the aquarist goals, meaning are they shooting for growth? Are they shooting for color? You see what I'm trying to say? And these things would create or determine potentially different lighting settings, different lighting environments, things like that. And, and you know, again, we've been reefing for quite some time. And I, I know you've seen the graduation where fluorescence has really become a big thing. You know, fluorescence in corals. In fact, Keith, if you remember, uh, you actually did a video on one of my products many, many years ago. And it was one of the first products showing this crazy type of fluorescence. Yep. And, 
And now that's really become more of a commonplace. So again, if those are your goals to develop these, 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 uh, everything from the pigments and other things like that in these corals to express this fluorescence, well, you may not use the same set of rules that somebody else would Yeah, use. I mean, there's so many variables in play with a reef tank, right? I mean, and lighting is just one of them. But then, then when you um, dig deeper into the lighting aspect, there's, there's a ton more variables involved. And, and there's always people out there that are just kind of like chasing that, uh, that silver bullet. And the question always is, well, what's the optimal lighting that I should be using for, let's say, SPS to achieve the best colors and the best growth? I mean, that's the most common question you'll see in terms of lighting. And there's really, as you just stated, there really is no easy answer because there's just so many things to consider. Well, they're kind of, you know, again, that's kind of a yes and no. And what I mean by that is, you know, one of the other things that people often kind of misconstrue, lighting is only one part of the equation, meaning you can have the, let's talk about SPS, for example, you can have what you think is the best lighting system money can buy. But guess what? If the other ingredients aren't there, and what I mean by ingredients, I mean water parameters, trace elements, you know, all these other things, the coral cannot capitalize. It cannot capitalize on the energy it's receiving. See, the energy is kind of part of the process. No different than we eat a hamburger, you know, for example. Our body breaks that down, and based on things going on in our body, our body is able to utilize that energy. You see what yep. I mean? And convert that into what our body needs. And corals pretty much behave much the same. So again, I, I often see people blaming lighting for their issue, when quite frankly, more often the problem lies someplace else. And by the way, just because your parameters seem perfectly in check, there's also things like micronutrients, you know, and even even though testing has got a lot better, gotten a lot better these days, uh, important ingredients like phosphates and even nitrates that are key. In fact, we'll talk about uh, phosphates just briefly. When you get a chance, Keith, after we get off the phone, look up ATP formation. Write that ATP down. ATP formation. Yes. And notice the P. Phosphate is one of those phosphate is one of those components. When you find the definition, and it'll be what the definition comes down to is the energy of life. So the point is, is that organisms, both us and even corals, they need phosphates. It's one of the critical elements. I seen a uh, 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 there was a discussion one time and somebody was talking about how their system had no uh, phosphates and Richard Ross and a few people were in the conversation. And I basically chimed in and I said, that's impossible because if there was no phosphate, life could not exist in that system. So, again, back to the lighting thing, just delivering the energy is one part of the component, making sure the other ingredients are there. Now the corals can effectively and efficiently utilize that energy that they're receiving. So Tulio, um, going off of that point in terms of the energy of light, you know, obviously there's options out there for, for lighting in terms of, um, you know, you've got LEDs, you've got T5s, metal halides. I still use metal halides, you know. I've been using metal halides for, for over 20 years, and I love them for my SPS dominant tanks. I use 20K 400 watt radium bulbs. They get uh, over overdriven a little bit, and I get great colors and growth, but a lot of people shy away from the metal halides because they will, uh, you know, heat up a tank, um, increase the electricity costs and what have you. But um, can you kind of talk about the energy for all those different types of, um, you know, options in terms of LEDs, T5s yep. and halides and how all that would, uh, you know, compare? Yes, yes. Yes, I can. And but but before we go there, you mentioned metal halides, right? Now, uh, again, with metal halides, when people talk about metal halides today, and most oftentimes when people are making these comparisons, if you really think about it, it's other manufacturers making those comparisons. So, so there's two things I have to say about that. One, if metal halides were not still an effective tool, then why does everybody compare their lighting to them? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Everybody like a metal halide or better than a metal halide. So what that's really saying is metal halide is kind of the standard. Yeah. The problem 
the older metal halide systems was heat. That, that, that was factual. And notice I used the word was heat, okay? And also was energy consumption. So, for example, halides today are not the same halides as, as they were years ago. Um, and, and this will be one of the brief times that I mentioned reef fright, but I have to because our halide system is unique in this way, meaning that my 250-watt halide actually uses the same amount of energy as a Radeon G4 Pro. And that's based on fact. That's based on watts, amps. You see what I'm saying? So, in other yep. words, a G4 now listen, radions are great lights. Okay, they're awesome lights. I'm good friends with the guys from Ecotex. Radions are great lights, even the new G5s. But the point is, the, the new G5 consumes 215 watts. That's per Ecotech. That's 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 the rating on the light. At 215 watts at let's say 120 volts, they're consuming about two and a half amps. This is based on their own electrical specification. My 250-watt side, okay, you're talking a difference in 35 watts, but that same 250-watt halide is actually pulling 2.1 amps at the wall. And we've, this has been tested. It's been validated. Uh, and in terms of temperature, in terms of temperature, I, I did a demonstration in my last lighting talk. I wish I had the fixture here to show you where I left the halide fixture running for an hour and put my hand right on top of it and held it there. You could never do that with older right. halide systems. Right. And, and, and this system does not use any fans. It's a different animal. The bulbs are better, fixture design is better, the ballasts are better. So halides are still an option. But now getting to your question, for example, with LEDs, with T5s, and with halides, for example, I'm gonna use a, a, a term uh, from a friend of mine, you know Sanjay, of course, and Sanjay is often quoted as saying a photon is a photon. So in essence, that photon from the LED or the photon from the, the T5 or the photon from the halide, for example, it's the same photon. Well, of course, there's more to it than, than that. And what I mean by that is now we talk about, remember I mentioned earlier on when I was talking about energy and we discussed delivery, yep. right? LEDs behave differently than T5s, which behave differently than metal halides. And um, I could pull up an image, but basically if I were to pull up spectral charts of the three different LED, T5, and metal halide, you would see completely different spectral characteristics. I mean, it's clear as a bell, meaning that, Keith, I could literally train you in less than a minute to be able to look at any spectral image and say that's a T5, that's an LED, that's a metal halide, okay? So they do have different characteristics. Now, based on emissions, we talked about corals being adaptive, right? I mean, Keith, think about it this way. How many aquariums have you seen, witnessed with your own two eyes, that had what would be considered less than ideal lighting? Could be fluorescent lights, could be power compacts, could be any range of different lighting. Yet there that aquarium stood in front of you and those corals were awesome. Yep. I mean, am I lying? <clears throat> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's true. I mean, I've, I've, um, I've seen obviously many tanks with, uh, with halides back in the day. And, um, you know, it's, it, uh, in terms of the LEDs, I, um, I have not uh, made that plunge yet. But I've seen some kick-ass LED uh, lit tanks. I've seen some awesome T5 tanks. I think um, you know another thing that uh, seems to be a, a popular thing to do is is a hybrid model. And, and I know Reef Bright does that in terms of halides and and um, your, uh, your your high output uh, LEDs. But you know you'll see a lot of T5s and and uh, LED uh, fixtures out there now too. So. You know, there's there's a lot of options, but you know, you also see a lot of people having success with all those different types of uh, options. Yes, and it's funny that you mentioned, for example, with the hybrid, right? Now, um, and I say this kind of sarcastically, right? When LEDs came into the industry, they basically were 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 stated as, "Hey, these things replace everything. Yeah, you no longer need fives." You no longer need, need metal halides. You never have to replace lamps and different things like that, okay? Two things with that. One, 
Think about how much money every, every one of us spends every day because we want to optimize our system for maximum growth, maximum, uh, uh, you know, best water parameters, best equipment, best flow. Um, and so the funny thing is, is that we do all of these things, but then all of a sudden when it, when it comes to replacing a bulb, we say, oh, no, we can't replace bulbs. That's ridiculous. But see, here's the irony with that. Whether it's a metal halide or a T5, whenever you replace that lamp, you restore the initial luminous output. Right. You see yeah. what I mean? You're restoring that to its original output. Right. Now, LEDs, they will degrade over time. I mean, Keith, you know, I've been working with LEDs longer than anybody. They will degrade over time. So what we've seen as of late with the ph phenomena with the hybrid systems where people say, hey, I'm adding T5s and now my system is, you know, seems to be responding better. It's not the T5. And here's what I'm getting at. We've, we're back to what I was saying about the delivery of light and those different characteristics between LED and T5 and metal halide. Okay. While LEDs are great, while LEDs are great, the energy, and I use that term again, energy, the energy that they, they emit, okay, the energy that's transmitted is, is kind of focused. It's kind of focused, meaning even coming out of the LED, for example, it's already at 140, uh, meaning just the LED, no secondary optic. Coming out of the LED, you're at 140 degree beam angle, give or take. And then you have your center flux, which is your center beam angle of the LED. So the light is already pretty much focused, right? Then they put focusing optics on there to give the appearance of even greater intensity or power. Because based on the laws of conservation, you can't create energy. You see what I yeah. mean, Keith? It, 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 it's a fact. It's physics. So why is it that when you measure this light from this optic, does it appear? And notice I use the word appear. Does it appear that this LED is putting out so much light? Well, that's very simple to explain. And I think you and I had this conversation over the phone. If we were outside in the sun and I took a magnifying glass and put it on your arm, what's going to happen? You're going to get burned because the magnifying glass is focusing the energy. But has the energy from the sun changed? No, it's not. So you could take a three watt LED, for example, and you can put a focusing optic on it and you can measure the light directly under it and get the appearance. And again, I use the word appearance, get the appearance that there's a lot more light there. But move that move that meter to the left or to the right. And you will see in, in a very short difference based on a singular secondary optic that that energy is just going to fall off the map. Now, the T5, because it has a 360 degree pattern of radiation, you're getting light coming in from all angles. The same thing with metal halides. One of the reasons why halides are so effective, again, they radiate light 360 degrees. It's coming in and bouncing in at all angles. Now, Keith, do you have a coral in your tank that's perfectly flat? No. Literally perfectly no. flat. No. So what happens is when you take aquaporas and other corals and you start forming these shapes, well, the interesting thing is, is even though the coral seems illuminated, it may not be receiving as much light as you think on the sides and other critical areas of the coral where flesh exists. Now, in the wild, this isn't the problem because when sunlight, because it's such a large point source, right, these corals are getting light and reflected light and all these things from all angles. With our aquariums being smaller units, and now you have these focused light sources, hence LEDs, if you will, with the secondary optics. Think of it like think of it like rain coming straight down on the corals. So you have many areas, and so now, so with the T5s, for example, it kind of helps fill in where the LEDs are right. missing. Not that the it's not that the T5 itself is anything critically special. Because it's filling the gaps, LEDs. yeah. Right. I, uh, Tulio, you mentioned uh, earlier on that um, you know, LEDs do degrade over time. What, um, what, what kind of degree of de uh, degradation occurs with LED uh, light fixtures? Well, the, the problem with degradation is, one, it's based on, first of all, it is based on the fixture design itself, meaning the hotter the fixture, 
the less efficient it is in converting wall energy to light energy. That also affects the performance of the LED because as the internal, basically as the internal temperature of the LED increases, its output performance decreases. Same thing, by the way, holds true for T5 lamps. A lot of people don't realize that when a T5 lamp gets too hot, anything over like 35 C, the output actually starts dropping exponentially. Can, can you um, say just in general, like a percentage, like let's say uh, an LED fixture over four years is going to lose 20% uh, of its intensity over four years? I mean, is that uh, in the ballpark? Is it, can, can you come up with a percentage? It probably, you know what, don't, don't, don't nail me to the cross, if you will, but, but, but four to five years at 20%, that's probably a fair assumption, but also keep in mind, a lot of people aren't running their LEDs at 100%. Right. They can't because they'll burn their corals. Right. And a lot of people are actually ramping their lights, which is something else that we can talk about. Because on one hand, I, I know that they were trained or, 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 or told that ramping lights is awesome because you're mimicking sunlight. But again, let's talk about the natural reef for a minute, Keith. Do you know a reef that's perfectly flat? No. Okay, so now let's let's take this imaginary mountain. Let's take this imaginary mountain and my coral sits right here. All right, here's the mountain, here's the coral. The sun is coming up. I got to try to do it this way. The sun is coming up. The sun is coming up. This coral still isn't receiving light. And what happens is once the sun gets to a certain angle and breaks that crest, all of a sudden, boom. There it is. Right. So again, and I'm not saying that there isn't. So the point is, the key with lighting is you want to maximize your photo period. And, and, and daily light integrals kind of opens up that, that door. And I give uh, Dana Riddle a lot of credit because he's something that brought a lot of awareness to daily light integrals. But back to the LEDs before we kind of leave, uh, uh, I would say about a tw listen. Regular use, meaning based on regular aquarium use, um, you should be able to get four to five years out of your LED fixture. After that time, you should absolutely consider servicing and or replacing said um, LED. Okay. Hey, Tulio, let's, uh, let's take a couple of questions from the viewers here. We have one question from, sure. from Planet3D. He says, um, or she, Tulio, I assume glass reflects and also refracts light if that is correct, question mark. What is the fundamental difference between a coralline algae covered back glass wall and a clean back black glass wall underwater? Well, the glass itself, okay? That's a good question, by the way. The glass itself becomes what we call, um, it's not quite a stop because we're presuming that the glass is transparent. So the difference becomes is when the coralline is on the glass, it literally becomes a stop because the light cannot pass through it. So reflection, reflection will be reduced based on what's being absorbed by the coralline. See, the other thing with light, when we, we oh, I, I, I'll, I'll use a very simple example here. If we had a coral that was blue, right? If we had a coral that was blue, optically what that's telling us is that for the most part, the blue light is being reflected because that's what we see. We don't see light. It's invisible to us. We only detect it. Our eyes detect it as photons are reflected off of other objects. Light in itself is invisible to us. So now we have this blue coral. The light hits the blue coral. The blue light, for the most part, is reflected off that blue coral, and that's what our eye is detecting. So what that's telling us is it's absorbing red and green. It's absorbing red and green. Now, how much is being utilized and things like that? So again, with that coralline, it is reflecting light. It is reflecting light, but it is absorbing some light in the process. Okay. It is some light in the process. Okay. So we have another question from K Dub Corals. And um, this person asked, I am starting a new tank and I decided to use an inexpensive T5 fixture and using ATI Blue Plus, uh, and I'm adding an additional LED strip for extra pop. Wants to know your thoughts on that. That's fine. 
I mean, you know, again, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed at what you could get away with. Okay, the difference in fixtures, it, it's not, you know what, hey, that that system will definitely get them going. The difference is, depending on the, the make or brand, they may not get the longevity out of it. They may not get the longevity out of it. And also, based on the fixture design itself, and meaning the reflector. Now, Keith, you've, you've, uh, you've seen many different T5 systems, obviously, yep. right? Where the reflector becomes important is if the reflector is too small and it's too close to the lamp, what it's actually doing is reflecting light back into the lamp. We call that restrike. Okay, that's also increasing light. First of all, you're losing light because the light can't get around. Basically, the light from the back of the bulb can't get out of its own way via the reflector and get down to your... Is that also... Um, does also cooling also have, come into play with that in terms of su sufficiently cooling a T5 bulb to, for it to perform? Uh, what? Does, uh, does cooling that bulb come into play when it does that if it's not uh, refracting the light properly? Well, well, it's going to heat... Yeah, yeah, the lamp is going to be hotter right. and therefore, therefore not only are you not going to get the optimum output from the lamp, but you'll also get premature lamp degradation. So with the user with that T5 system, uh, you know, if they can put some type of ventilation or circulation around there or, or something of that effect, because I'm assuming it doesn't have watertight end caps, so you have to keep the, the lens on it to protect it. Um, just try to keep that thing as cool as you can and they should, uh, they should be okay. Yeah, you, you see some T5 fixtures that don't have cooling fans. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, it depends on the design of the fixture. Our T5 systems have no cooling fans. But then again, their reflectors are completely different, which allows not only more light to be reflected, but more importantly, it allows air to circulate around the lamp so that it can breathe. So by, oper by operating at its optimal temperature, the lamp runs more efficiently, and when the lamp runs more efficiently, it also runs more cooler. So it really depends on fixture design. Gotcha. Um, Planet uh, 3D had a question earlier about moonlight schedules and, and is wondering whether or not you see there uh, being a benefit to running a mo moonlight schedule for a reef tank. Well, you know, that has been discussed. That has been discussed. There is absolutely one thing I can say for a fact is there is absolutely response. OK, that's why, uh, uh, Keith, you remember back in the ice cap days yep. and all of that, some of the first moonlights and things like that. And when I was manufacturing them, first of all, people don't realize that actual moonlight is white. It's not blue. True moonlight is white. It's not blue. Okay? It looks, it looks but blue. But here's what happens. If you take a white LED, a single white LED, and you put it over a tank at night, it looks like crap. People don't like that. So what they started to do was focus on, now again, remember that light we talked about, delivery, utilization, there's absorption, reflection. Yep. Well, what we found was that the blue section of that light was primarily what was being utilized. And conveniently, the blue made our corals look really cool. So the companies that I was manufacturing these for, I said, hey, you got two choices. You want scientific moonlight, which is going to look like crap, or do you want something that's going to look really cool? And guess what? What do you think they chose? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the one that looked cool. Yeah. So moonlight's, yeah, it is beneficial. Um, how much you need to cycle it with moon cycles and things like that. Again, it depends on how many moonlights you're running, because it, just like anything else, there is such a thing as too much. You know what I mean? There is such a thing as too yeah, much. Yeah, I've never, um, you know, I used to have, uh, geez, what's the name of the uh, the company? They're not, they're not in business anymore. It's a German company, um, Sigfloy. Is that the name? How do you pronounce the, uh, the company, Sigfloy? They used to make uh, metal halide and uh, T5 fixtures. Well, I had one of those and it came with a, uh, with a moonlight um, LEDs on it. And, and um, I don't think I ever ran it. I, I've never run a moonlight schedule on my tanks. But um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a nice to have, but for me, I've never utilized something like that. It's not mandatory and I'll tell you why. What a lot of people don't realize is that even at nighttime, 
even at nighttime, there's a lot of available ambient light. I mean, have you ever noticed, and, and, and it's called scotopic and photopic vision, meaning dark light and, 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 and bright lighting environments because our eyes adapt to that. Have you ever noticed at nighttime when you first wake up, everything seems pitch black? Yeah. But then if you 15 or 20 minutes, you can start seeing things. Right. And interesting, it takes about 20 photons. It takes about 20 photons for our eyes to start, uh, let's say, working. And actual moonlight its actual intensity, let's say in the ocean, it's literally only a few lumens. It's not very intense at all. So many times the ambient light in our rooms or in our homes is actually acting like that moonlight environment and we don't even realize. Interesting. So we, uh, we have a question, uh, Tulio, from Mostly Reefs. He's uh, or she is asking, how close are we to replicating the overall coverage ability of T5s with LEDs? T5 seem to light the dead spots, whereas LEDs can create them. Well, we're actually there. We're, see, again, we're actually there. And I don't want, uh, guys, listen, I don't want this to be an infomercial. And, and Keith and I discussed how I didn't want to talk about Reef Fright because I don't want this to be an infomercial. But the fact of the matter is, is that the XHOs that I know some of you have heard of. Keith, do you remember the VHO lamps? I do. I remember the VHO lamps. Yeah. The XHOs, which have been around for over 10 years, I designed those to replace T5 lamps. And not just in terms of light, but in terms of their transmission and their optical characteristics. Okay? So that's why... Uh, Keith, I don't know if you've seen those add-on kits yep. that we have for the radio, yep. the XHOs. Yep. People have been using those and saying, hey, man, my out consumption is going up. Well, why is your out consumption going up? Because your corals are growing because they're getting light in places they weren't before. So we really are, we really are there, again, but not all LED systems are the same because they will behave different optically. They will behave different optically. Right, I think you've seen. Um, well, I, you know, there there was a change, right, with the uh, with the radions between the Gen Four and the Gen Five. They went from that puck design to uh, to something different, and I think that kind of addressed that uh, point you just talked about in terms of coverage, right? Yes, yes, yes. They changed. They changed the lens. They changed the lens to get improved distribution. But again, it is based on physics, meaning that if my light source is here. It, I'll, I'll try to do this so we can keep it in the screen. If my light source is here and my tank is like this big and that light source is here, well, based on physics and optics, it can only provide X amount of distribution. So having light sources on the outside of it is absolutely going to improve the optical environment so that you're getting light distribution uh, uh, all over the place. Right. I think that's why uh, these hybrid systems seem to be... Um I don't, I don't want to say popular, but it seems like a lot of folks are using them just to try to overcome the, uh, you know, s some potential uh, coverage limitations with the LEDs. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why, frankly, listen, I think T5s are great. We make them. We make great T5 systems. But the reason why I developed that add-on kit for the radions and the hydras and those units is because, Keith, as you know, not everybody can put a T5 over their tank. They can't hang something. That's why they got their RMS mounts and their HMS mounts, because they like the sleek look of the mounts and things like that. So this way, with these systems, they're able to get the advantages of T5 and still use their RMS and HMS mounts, and the, the system becomes cohesive. So now they don't have this large kind of fixture over their right. tank. So Planet 3D had a follow-up question to his um, question about the uh, coralline algae. He's, he's asking um, Tulio, following up on that question about, um, about that, assume a glass-bottom aquarium would be better. He's assuming a glass-bottom aquarium would be better than a sand bed for reflection of light around the bottom of the tank? Well, not always. Not always, because that glass-bottom tank more often than not, it's going to be on some type of, of, of stand or something where under the glass is going to be black. 
where you're going to, or, or a darker, it could be a gray, it could be a black, it could be whatever. Um, and again, based on the angles of light, based on the angles of light, what's going to happen is a good deal more of the light is either going to travel, it will be refracted, but, but very little will be reflected back up, or what will happen is the, 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 the underside of the tank, it, it, if it's black, or let's say if the, the, the stand is black, that will actually absorb a good deal of the light. Now, aragonite-based sand, if it's clean, if it's clean, of course, if it's not clean, well, that creates other issues. But if it's pure aragonite sand and it's white, you will get more reflection. And here's why. Your sand is never perfectly flat. See, when light is reflected, the reflection is based on the angle of incident. Angle of incident means angle of reflection. So what happens is when you have these like, uh, like basically it's not a flat surface. You see what I'm yeah, trying yeah. to say? Now what happens is it changes that and now the light starts getting bounced around more because it's not just a straight reflection. It's now hitting this little granule or it's hitting something else and now that photon's going in a completely different direction. Gotcha. So K-Dub Corals has a... Uh... We were talking before about cooling T5s, and, and the question is, what's the most efficient way to, uh, to cool them direct on the fixture or to actually cool the water? You know, I guess uh, the, he's talking about uh, using fans on, on top of the water versus actually cooling the fixture itself. Or is it a combination? Well, ideally, if you could cool the fixture, that would be the best scenario. Because by cooling the fixture, then there's going to be less heat transference because the fixture itself, the bulb's going to be operating more efficiently. See, here's where the efficacy comes into play. When the bulb is running too hot, it's called droop. When the bulb is running too hot, because it's not operating at its maximum efficiency, energy is being converted to heat rather than being converted to light. So by having that bulb operate at its ideal temperature, more energy is being converted to light than is being converted to heat. So the lamp is naturally going to run cooler. Uh, also, cooling the fixture, even if it was kind of a scenario where you're blowing under the fixture so that it's kind of hitting the fixture, but it's still blowing over the water, because if you're just cooling the water, then you're just cooling the water. You're really not doing anything uh, for the fixture itself. Right. So, Tulio, you, uh, you, you briefly mentioned uh, Reef Bright, and um, I did have some questions for you about, about what you guys, uh, you know, your product line and, and, and the technologies that you utilize for, for Reef Bright. So, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, first of all, in, in terms of, you know, what would you, how would you compare? So, you talked about the XHO and, and that, um, you know, in, in terms of how, how, how would that compare to a T5 in terms of the technology and, and in terms of the output? What, um, what was the, was the XHO really designed to be a T5 replacement? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And based on studies we've done, based on studies we've done and other comparisons, now, based on the studies, we've measured the replacement of up to two T5 lamps. So one XHO, two T5 lamps, okay? One XHO, two T5 lamps. But even being conservative, you know, because you know me, Keith, I like, to, I like to be very conservative, okay? It will absolutely replace it. And I'll use our halide hybrid, for example. You must have at some time seen us at one of the shows or seen the halide hybrid, yeah, yeah. right? The halide hybrid has two little 15-inch XHOs. It has two XHOs, one on either side. Now, when we're demonstrating that fixture, those two little 15-inch XHOs, which are the same XHOs we use for the Radeon kits, by the way, but those two little 15-inch XHOs are competing with a 250-watt halide. And yet when we, plug, when we unplug those XHOs, you absolutely see a difference in terms of spread, in terms of color, and things like that. So when I design the XHOs, when I design, see, the problem, every, every lighting technology has its pros and its cons. It does have its pros and its cons. So let's talk about a T5, for example. Aside from the basic characteristics of the lamp, something else that people don't often realize is 
Your entire T5 lamp is not producing light. A few inches on either end of the lamp are actually not emitting light. It's just an optical thing because the lamp seems to be filled with light, so it looks illuminated. But scientifically, there's a couple of inches on either end of that lamp that's not emitting light. But what happens with reflectors, what happens with reflectors is every time that light has to strike that reflector, on average, there's about a 6 to 7% loss. Okay, because again, it, 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 there's always loss. Whenever there's an interaction with anything, whether it's kinetic energy, light energy, whatever the case is, there's always loss. So when you're reflecting that light, it's not really an ideal environment. You're just making the best with what you have to work with. Now, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, well, actually over 20 years ago, when I started working with high power LEDs, I said, hey, here's this great device where basically nearly all the light it's, it's emitting is already facing down. You see what I mean, Keith? It's already facing down. So how can I treat that light? How can I treat that light so that it will in fact behave like a T5? And because you have seen some of our products, I can confidently say that any one of the LED lights we've ever sent you looks unlike any other LED light you've ever That's seen. True. And I'm not saying that from a like a bragging thing. I'm saying that optically they're different. And so getting back to the XHO, XHO is an acronym. Remember when we had the SHO lamps? Yeah. Remember the SHO lamps? We had VHO, SHO. So the XHO was just a play on those acronyms because it was designed to replace those. So Tulio, your 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 hybrid light is a metal halide you know, XHO light, right? And, and that's rare in this um, industry right now because all the hybrid lights that you're seeing out there are pretty much like LED T5. Why, why are you guys using that metal halide as the main source of your hybrid lighting? Well, we, in all fairness, we do have T5 hybrid systems, but here's the thing, guys, and listen, you can take it for what it's worth, I get it, but here's what I'm going to say. I've been working with LEDs over 12, over 20 years. I've been reefing a hell of a long time. My gut, my scientifically in terms of photonics and everything else like that, people can say what they want, but depending on the aquarium, depending on the application, metal halide is a hard animal to beat. And you're actually seeing people converting back to them. And I know this factually because I supply lighting for some of the people, uh, some big public aquariums, for example, throughout the country that converted to halide systems. And they found that in these larger systems, the response in their anemones wasn't the same. The response in the corals wasn't the same. And they've actually reverted back to halide systems. Now, again, Lighting is based on application. If you have a 20 gallon Nuvo, is a 250 watt halide the light for you? Absolutely not. But once you break a certain area of tank in terms of cost of ownership and operation and things like that, when you're dealing with much larger systems, then halides really start to become a, a, a very viable option. Um, just a quick uh, clarification, uh, Tulio, uh, CB's reef, uh who's from the UK, is, is just uh, ask, asking for the definition of the, uh, what, what, what does XHO stand for, SHO stand for? Well, SHO, SHO, which was basically, it was a power compact lamp, okay? I believe it was a aquarium, oh God, aquarium systems was the one who released the, the, the fixture. You remember aquarium systems. Yeah. So the, the SHO was super high output. That's what SHO stands for. XHO means extreme high output. Honestly, it was just a play of words. It sounded cool. And I kind of got the idea from the SHO Mustang. Remember the SHO Mustangs? And I said, wow, that sounds, you know, that sounds kind of cool. How can we play with that acronym a little bit? And that's where XHO came from. So the, um, the LED light technology has changed a lot over the last five years. You know, I, um, I started the tank actually in the background uh, behind us, which you can't see because you're not, uh, you're not watching us on YouTube right now. And, and um, 
was, um, you know, that was a tank I started about five years ago. And I, I thought about LEDs for that tank, but I had such great success with the halides and the T5 combo that I decided, you know what, I need to stick with the, what's been working for me. So that's what I'm going to um, utilize. But, you know, over the last few years, things have really changed, it seems, in terms of that LED technology. And, um, I mean, where do you see it going in the next two or three years? Do you, do you see uh, continued improvement on that front? Okay, Keith, I'm glad you asked me that question. And again, Keith, I'm glad you know me because you and I know the same people. And I've been asked this question by literally some of the top people, in, you, you know, some of the top, whether you want to call it influencers or people in our industry. And think about this, Cliff. I, I mean, think about this, uh, uh, Keith. I'm sorry. Didn't we ask this 10 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm getting at here? And, and I'm making a point here, meaning that the truth is, have LEDs improved? I guess technically I can say yes. But in truthfulness, the technology hasn't changed. It's the same. The physics, the architecture has not changed. OK, literally, scientifically, the physics and the architecture haven't changed. In fact, Keith, do you remember the Solaris from PFO? I, um, I used to have PFO ballasts. Well, PFO in 2005 released a LED fixture that did pretty much what every one of these LED fixtures did today in terms of the ramping and all of these other things like that. It just didn't do the Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth, which they were actually working on. But my point is, is that the efficiency, the efficiency of LEDs has improved because like computer chips and things like that, manufacturing has improved and all these other things. But the core technology has really not changed. And unfortunately, in today's age of, of control, if you will, all of that control, and listen, whether you're into that or not, I'm not knocking anybody, but what I'm saying is that it does not improve the light source itself, right? Keith, how long have you been keeping reef tanks? I say 25 plus years, but it, it might be going on 30 years. I don't know. I got I to gotta look that up somehow. <laughs> okay, but remember back in the day when we used to turn our lights on and off? Yeah. How did you keep your corals? How did you grow those huge SPS systems and tanks without ramping your lights and without all of these light settings? Yeah, I never did that. Yeah. I, you see what I mean? So there's the irony there. So what's really critical, what's really critical is the quality of the light source you're using, meaning the quality of energy, the quality of energy, the method, the method of delivery. The method of delivery, because without proper delivery, that energy cannot be utilized. And here's what I mean. Even though Sanjay says a photon is a photon, right? The reason why I keep referring to delivery, it's like a keyhole. You can have a key, but only if you put it in the lock correctly can you open the lock. And that's the way absorption works. See, not every photon that strikes uh, an electron is absorbed. Many of them are bounced off. It has to arrive at a very specific angle. That electron, which is what absorbs the photon itself, which is in the cells and things like this in the atomic structure, okay, various conditions have to exist, meaning the state of the electron, angles and things like that. So that's why delivery is absolutely critical. And then the overall distribution the overall distribution. And talking about par for a minute, right, Keith, think about this. And I know you've done this yourself probably. When you measure par, you measure par straight up, right? I don't have a, I don't have a measure, par meter, but, um, you know. I'm sure you've measured it at one time with a par meter or, or people that have used par meters. Yeah. And we measure like straight up. Well, guess what? No, set it at an angle. Put it right next to that coral on an angle to see what light it's actually receiving. And I think you'll be astonished when you go to certain areas of your tank how little these corals are actually receiving and how much those PAR readings change because that's how the coral is seeing the light. Again, an aquapore is not perfectly flat. Right. You have branches, you have sides. So if my radion is here, if my radion is here and my aquapore is here, the light's coming like, well, I'm hoping, I'm hoping the light is coming like this. It's not coming like this. 
So again, sometimes it can be good to measure straight up. But again, taking that taking that example, whereas if my if my LED puck was here where my hand is and my acropora was over here. Right now, if I took a par meter and put it right here, I might not measure any light at all. Right. Now, I'm not going to measure any light at the back because the coral itself becomes a stop. So you're not going to have you can have very little light back there. But you'd probably be shocked to find how much light is actually coming into the sides of the corals and other examples where corals, depending on their location of the tank, you may find that they're getting very little light at the back of the coral or at this section of the coral. So move the par meter around. Don't just keep it straight up. Hey, folks, I just want to remind you to feel free to ask questions. We've got, uh, we, we have a real treat here with Tulio joining us, and, and he is a lighting guru, expert, whatever you want to call it. So feel free to uh, throw out your questions there, and, and uh, Tulio can address them. Hey, Tulio, I want, I want to ask you a question of my own. <clears throat> In terms of uh, watts per gallon for a, uh, for a reef tank, what, um, what, what should an Aquarius be shooting for? I, you know, obviously, it depends on the type of tank, whether it's an SPS dominant tank or if it's a, uh, you know, a softy tank or a mixed reef with SPS and, and uh, LPS. But uh, you know, what's the general rule of thumb, let's say, if you had an SPS well, dominated tank for watts per gallon? It, it, you know what, Keith? It, I, I'm, I'm smiling. I'm smiling as you mentioned that. Um, because one of the things I talk about some of my other talks is that wattage is not a way to compare light sources. Wattage is strictly consumption. It has nothing to do with how much light is optically being emitted. Optical power and wattage are two different things because wattage is electro electrical consumption. Optical power is something completely different. So, for example, if you have that, that 215 watt Radeon, that, that, that's the consumption of the fixture. It is not putting out 215 watts optically. In fact, it's going to be a lot less. Now, that's not the fault of the Radeon. That's lighting in general. That's lighting in general, the optical energy. And that's another important area where we start to talk about wavelengths and things like that. And by the way, I'm going somewhere with this, but wavelengths have different energy levels. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy level. That's why aquarists have been able to be successful with these blue reef tanks, because the energy level in the blue region is actually higher than energy, let's say, in the green and the red regions. So what happened is these corals are adapting. They're adapting and they're utilizing that available energy. OK, they're you. But now back to the watts per gallon thing, because, listen, you and I are both old school and that's how we used to do things back in the day. Three, four, five watts per gallon, you, you know, four to five watts being considered your higher intensity, three watts being somewhere in the middle and your two watt kind of on the lower. You know, you're really kind of lower end side. Three end with three was somewhere in the middle. But here's the interesting thing, Keith, and I don't know if this was accidental, because even in science, you have, you know, you have these kind of accidental coincidences that I've talked about. When I've done comparisons of light testing, because I did it just out of curiosity, because I always wanted to blow that whole watts per gallon thing out of the water. Listen, I, I've often said how Kelvin and how our industry uses Kelvin, excuse my language, is BS. <laughs> and I proved it at my Masna talks and my Magna talks and my other talks. I proved all the fallacies with per and par, not saying that they can't be useful, but I'm just saying that, that those things tell you very little about the actual light itself. But son of a bitch, wouldn't you know it, the watt per gallon thing is one thing I couldn't debunk because whether it's coincidence or otherwise, it kind of still holds true. Yeah. It kind of still holds true. So you really want to be, again, let's use a radion. Let's use this example, Keith. We have a 75-gallon tank. It's a four-foot tank, right? We put two radions on there, right? You would say that two radions, two radion XR30s uh, would, be, would be good for a 75-gallon tank, right? Yeah, we agree 24 inches per, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we got two radions. So now let's say they're 200 watts, right? They're 200 watts a piece. So there's 400. Divide 75 
into 400. Yeah. Oh, I got my calculator right here. <laughs> 400 by 75 you're talking about? Yeah, that's 5.3. Bingo. Isn't that isn't that our isn't that our at, and here's the other thing isn't here's the other interesting thing about that by the way now we're not going to run that radion at a hundred percent so let's say we run them each at seventy five percent right now we're talking three hundred watts seventy five into three hundred is four yep so now we have four watts per yep. gallon so you see what I mean that that that. I don't know if it was accidental because I, I, I can confidently tell you, I can confidently tell you that it was an estimation when they first started using it based on the lighting we were using back in the day. You know what I mean? There was no kind of fact behind how they right. came up with it, for example. It was just based on what we were utilizing and what seemed to right. work. But interestingly enough, that that one calculation has stood up over keeps, time. Keeps kind of ended up in the same place. <laughs> yes, keeps kind of ended up in the same so, uh, place. So, Tulio, another question I had for you. How important is the blue spectrum for SPS coral coloration? Well, you know what? <clears throat> it depends on the SPS. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a funny quick story example. Uh, before Joy and I moved to uh, New Jersey, I had a Planet Aquarium's tank, and I had all these corals in there. And I was running my metal halides, of course, right? So Joy came back from a show. Joy came back from a show. And Lou and Vic from Worldwide Corals, they sent Joy home with a couple of corals. And I'm like, I, I mean, of course, I was very grateful. But at the same token, I'm saying, man, when am I, you know, where am I supposed to put these corals now? You know, it's like, you know how that is. Yeah. You're trying to find a spot. Wedge them corals. in. So I pull this one SPS out. Now, I'll be the first to admit, when it comes to lighting, Yes, of course, I can talk about lighting. When it comes to corals, while I understand husbandry and I understand all of that, coral identification has never been one of my strong suits. So I'm just looking at an SPS coral. And you and I both know, in the old days, SPS coral hit that thing with as much light as you possibly yeah. can. So take this SPS, I put it front and center on the top of the reef because I was able to find a little spot in the, and this thing was just getting blasted by the halides. When I say this thing was receiving levels of par of 800 to 1,000, I am not exaggerating, wow. okay? That's cooking. Now here- You're, cook, you're, you're cooking the, with gas with that there, right? Here's the thing though, Keith. You know what the coral was? It was a deep water echinata. Yeah, wow. But here's what happened. Here's what happened. Remember what I was talking about, the importance of distribution and light arriving from all angles, yeah. right? The coral didn't burn. I didn't burn the coral. What it ended up doing was between regulation and protection, it developed these insane blue and purple pigments, like this iridescent color. So again, sometimes depending on the colors that you're trying to develop in corals, uh, you do need more than blue light. You do need more than blue light. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, all right, we got another question here, Tulio, from Planet 3D. And um, the question is, Tulio, with so many factors relating to light penetration, water quality, um, particulates, water movement, etc., cetera, uh, is there any value in these cloud modes? Oops. Yes, are there, is there any uh, value in these cloud modes that are common... Uh, that are a common function of the LED lights? I mean, my opinion is no. My opinion is no. But again, again, that's assuming the distribution of light, meaning that um, in theory, it's supposed to give the corals brief periods of rest. Uh, there has been studies with strobing of light and things like that. Um, the main thing is, is to find that balance between your intensity to find that balance between intensity and getting that light to be distributed over as much of an area as possible. Because here's another reason why maximizing your photo period becomes interesting. Now, Keith, I have a question for you, being you're a halide yeah. guy, right? 
if you've noticed, if you've noticed trending with some of the newer reef tanks, and I'm not saying this to criticize anybody, I'm just saying this strictly out of observance, right? If you notice a lot of the trending with a lot of the newer reef systems, especially when they're ramping and doing a lot of these things, you often notice them saying, hey, I'm having a problem keeping my pH at 8.1, 8.2, yeah. right? I mean, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know what I'm, I, I don't want people to think I'm making this up. So, so, so we see this trend. Now, here's the question I have for you, Keith, because I know you've run some serious halide systems in the past, and I'm making a point here. I'm making a point here. With your halide systems, those, the, your, your super intense halide systems, have you ever had a problem maintaining a pH over eight? Uh, no. no, the only time would be, you know, when, when I use a calcium reactor, but, uh, you know, I use a caulkwasser to, uh, to up that, um, you know, pH and also second chamber with the calcium yeah, reactor helps absorb that CO2. People today are using calc washer and calcium reactors too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But your system, I can confidently say you didn't have a problem maintaining that higher pH. And there's a reason why there's a reason why right next to that ATP formation that I told you to write yeah. down, down photolysis, photolysis. Yeah, photolysis. You can look it up. It's no big deal. But anyway, here's my point. The, the simplest explanation is when light, when light interacts with a solution, in this case, water, it, 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 it changes molecularly. OK, so now with water, the ocean, your aquarium, especially with hay, when light hits water, your O and your H start to separate. Your O and your H start to separate. Now, Keith, if, 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 if I asked you this, what is pH? And I'm not doing this to try to put you on the spot, but this is, again, one of those things that many people often use the term but don't completely grasp its kind of importance or meaning. But if I asked you what pH is, what is well, pH? Well, it's ability to buffer, you know, right? So. Well, well yeah, no, and, and that's... Oh, okay, that's the response we would get from hobbyist or aquarist, if you will, because again, that's what they've been taught. But what I mean is, what is pH? What is that P and what does that H mean? Basically, in short, and again, you can look it up if you want, it's power of hydrogen, it's potential hydrogen, it's hydrogen potential, potential how, however you want to slice it or dice it, right? Now, here's my question for you. We've often attributed change in pH. We know for a fact that there's a correlation with light and pH, right? We know that. We've all observed that. Every person watching this right now has observed their pH change when their lights right. come on. Now, we've often been told, we've often been told that that's because the corals are consuming the carbon dioxide, right? Yeah. Keith, is that yeah, a fair, yeah, yeah. Is that fair accurate, right? And the corals are producing oxygen. Well, here's the question I have for you. And again, you could look this up for yourself because I've had fun with this with a bunch of other guys in our industry. Here's my question. Can the pH of a solution change? In other words, the hydrogen potential has to change right. in order for pH to change. Right. If the hydrogen potential doesn't change, the pH cannot change. Right. You see what I'm trying yeah. to say? And, and of course, I'm really simplifying it, guys. So again, don't like hold me to the cross. I'm trying to take a very complex thing and shrink it down into as simple of, of, of an explanation as we can. But basically, it comes down to hydrogen potential. So here's what happens. When you're hitting your aquarium with light, that O and H is separating. And guess what? That H is being used by other things as well. Because H, if you look it up, hydrogen will, will bond with any number of things. So the point is, is that getting running your light intensity at higher intensity without, of course, without uh, 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 being becoming problematic to your corals. OK, but by increasing lighting intensities and by increasing intensity over time or your DLI, you will absolutely have improved uh, pH. Because think about it, Keith, back in the day, we ran our halides, what, six to eight hours a day? I run mine more than that. <laughs> okay. But, but again, my point is that intense light. Right. You're constantly getting that O and that H separation. 
And that's why you can maintain that better pH. Yep. Um, Tulio, there's a, uh, I think a related question to this from Reggie Perryman. He's, or she is asking, well, he is asking, doesn't lighting with nutrients have a relationship also with the alkalinity levels? Well, well, uh, yes, it will. Yes, it will. And again, now you're getting into the chemical side. Now you're getting into the chemical side. And, and frankly, guys, listen, I'll be honest. I'm not a chemist. A chemist is one thing I am not. But alkalinity, the problem with alkalinity is it depends on the corals. Do you have a lot of stony corals? It depends on the source water. There's so many, there's so many factors in terms of alkalinity itself. Everything from the source water, uh, uh, you name it, that's going to help determine the alkalinity of a system. Yep. Um, all right, we got a, a, another question, and I, I know Tulia, you got another, you got another uh, call to go to, right? In uh, in, a, in, a, in a little bit there, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna let you go in a few minutes. But uh, we got another question from um, from uh, Carrie Reefer five hundred five hundred is asking. So your your Reef Bright Halide. Um, fixtures don't have fans in them right no so i guess there's two questions there one one from him is that um are you planning on coming out with a fixture with fans and i, I think the answer to that is no right because they don't need fans no and here's when i designed the fixture some 10 years ago when i designed the fixture some 10 plus years ago um i purposely didn't utilize fans and here's why remember i was talking about that lamp efficacy lamp temperature and lamp efficacy, a metal halide lamp needs to be at a very specific temperature to operate the most efficiently. And the reason why it becomes important is, again, it's, it's, almost, an ox, it's almost an oxymoron. The lamp has to get hot in order for it to run cool. You see what I mean? So what happens is if you took a fan and you're blowing it on a metal halide lamp, you're actually decreasing the efficacy of the lamp. So what I did was I was actually working on some of the the first uh, the first moonlights. Remember those moonlights I used to make with the little heads and it was on the, they looked like little soldiers. You could bend them. It had like the little lock line on them. Well, one day I'm working at my station, one day I'm working at my station, and I forget whether it was for Champion Lighting or somebody I was working with at the time, and at the time, we were trying to break the 400-watt barrier. And what I mean by that is, you know, you remember when 400-watt halides first came into the industry. The challenge was de designing a fixture environment that wouldn't melt the wires inside the fixture. Literally, okay, literally, that was the challenge because many of the cords that we had to deal with were rated to like 105C, mm. okay, anything over 105C, and that's it. That cord was toast, and, and so, so that was the challenge. So one day, one day, I'm working with my soldering station. Have you ever done any soldering? I used to, uh, you remember that company, Heathkit? You can make, you can make yeah. uh, electronics from scrap, so yeah, I used to uh, solder you know, stuff with the, so, those heat kits, yeah. So one day I'm my station, one day I'm using my station, and I put my soldering gun back in the holder, the protective holder, and the light bulb went off in my head. Here I have this soldering iron with this super hot tip, but yet if I touch the protective uh, cover, I don't get, you know, my skin won't melt to yeah. the thing, right? So I said, okay, now, how can I create an environment to maintain the lamp temperature, but still keep the fixture cool? So the, the halide that I designed, it's actually a fixture inside a fixture, meaning the inner fixture, which is the reflector, it, 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 it encapsulates the lamp and maintains the temperature so that it can operate at optimum efficiency, right? Then the outer fixture, now it's important to state that the entire fixture is all anodized aluminum, and powder coated. And then I designed it so that when the heat is generated from the lamp, what happens, what happens when heat is generated, Keith? It rises. Right. So using convection currents, I actually used the very heat that the halide uh, inner assembly was generated to create a convection fan for the fixture itself. So the fixture actually cools itself while it's operating, and that's why, hence, 
you can literally hold your hand on the fixture when it's been operating for quite a few hours and literally just hold your hand there. And we have had lots of users that have put them on 75 and smaller, let's say 90 gallon tanks and 75 gallon tanks, and they have not had to run a chiller. Now, unfortunately, listen, if you're living in Arizona and the ambient temperature in your home is 80 degrees already, then you already have problems because your pumps and other items, which also generate a lot of heat, are going to be importing a lot, in, going to be imparting a lot of heat on that system. So ambient temperature is also important with any lighting system. So Tulio, we got a question. Uh, Greg Carroll is actually watching, and um, he. Oh, Greg, troublemaker man. I don't know if we can take any questions <laughs> from him. Greg, how you doing, buddy? So he says, uh, Tulio, I've seen some YouTubers showing Orphic. Light bars producing way more par than reef bright bars. Can you explain to everyone that peak par is not a true measurement of total output? Well, and, and you know what, Greg? <clears throat> that, that's a very good point. The, the, the bars that he's describing, the bars that he's describing, Keith, remember when we were talking about those secondary optics? Yeah. Okay. In fact, I had an Orphic user, by the way, I had an Orphic user plug in our fixture and plugged in the ident the identical size Orphic fixture and literally stated himself, he did this independently, that both fixtures consume the same amount of power, okay? The primary difference between our fixture and the other fixtures, if you will, is because they use secondary optics. And, and by the way, it's not, when they produce like a ton more par, that's not necessarily true. Do they produce more par when you're measuring directly under it? Yes, they do. But remember I was telling you about the magnifying glass, yep. right? And the focus light? Well, what the Reef Bright does, and by the way, it's designed purposefully to do this. If you took that Orphec bar or, or other LED bar, because I don't, I don't like to, to, to talk ill about other products or manufacturers, but if you took that optical system and you put it on a test, test rack where you take your PAR sensor and start to do this, what will happen is when you move to a certain area, you're going to see that light completely fall off. So the one thing that the Reef Brights still own is nothing spreads like, like the XHOs. So while they might, let, let's say an Orphec might deliver a par of 145 and the Reef Bright might deliver a par of 100. The difference is, is that that is going to deliver that par in a given area where the Reef Bright is going to deliver that 100 par in a much broader area. And remember how we talked about earlier, what's really important, it's not the par, it's the optical energy itself and being able to get into all of those nooks and crannies. So X, great. Did that answer his question? Greg, I think so. <laughs> um, I, got a, I got another question here, uh, Tulio, and actually it's a question I'm interested in myself. It's from, um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, so apologize, I apologize if I'm, I'm not doing that correctly. The uh, Diacanus... Yeah, I can't even pronounce it. Um, Reef, I know you didn't want to talk Reef Bright, Tulio, but could you talk about the effects of lighting your reef with the twin arc metal halide without a tempered glass shield limiting UV input? I think meant output. Okay. Uh, the twin arc lamp itself, what makes it different is it's two arc tubes, first of all, whereas a standard metal halide lamp is a single arc tube, Okay. Um, they don't fire at the same time. That's something that some people will often kind of get confused. What they do is they alternate over the life of the lamp based on what we call preferential ionization. That becomes critical for two reasons. One, normally we're trained to replace our metal halide lamps, what, once a year is kind of the average rule of thumb. Well, with a conventional metal halide lamp, that single arc tube has been operating for a year. So it's going to have considerably more degradation. Whereas with the twin arc, each of those arcs is only operated about six months. So you're going to have a much more stable lamp. You're going to have a much more stable output uh, in terms of color, right? In terms of uh, a color and things like that. That's also much more stable. And the other interesting thing is, is notice we keep coming back to the distribution and all these things we're talking about with energy. What happens is every time those arc tubes alternate, the angle of incident changes slightly. 
The angle of incident actually changes. So it's like moving the light source. Every time that arc tube, every time that arc tube arc alternates, it's like it's like moving or alternating the light gotcha. source. Gotcha. Um, one more question about refugium lights. Any thoughts on uh, or any views about you know the best lights to light a refugium? Well, uh, you know what? To be frank, to be frank, when it comes to refugium lighting, I mean, you can use everything from a CFL lamp to you name it. It doesn't have to be terribly expensive. The key with refugium light, guys, though, this is important, please. Safety. Safety. That refugium down there, you have a lot of humidity. Your doors are often closed. You know what I mean? The refugium's often closed off. You have water splashing and things like that. So if you're going to use a light source for your refugium, can you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and successfully buy something or go on Amazon? Absolutely. Because, Keith, you know me. I talk straight with hobbyists. But the safety is paramount. You want to be – because now you have screw-in sockets and things like that. So, so safety, be really careful about that. All right, last question, I promise, because I want to be respectful of your time there, Tulio. And, and it's a couple of folks in the UK are wondering when they're going to be able to um, purchase the, uh, the XHO Reef Bright bars over there. Actually, they're already over there. There's a company by the name of Aquarium Connections. Yeah. There's a company by the name of Aquarium Connections. If they look them up, uh, Aquarium Connections, they're our UK distributor. And we've actually sold quite a few units. Uh, we've already sold quite a few units into the UK. So if they get a hold of Aquarium Connections, they can they can contact cool. them. Tulio, man, I got to thank you so much for being a guest. It was very entertaining. I think the viewers got a lot out of it. A lot of questions were being asked. Um, any final thoughts you want to share with us before uh, you uh, we, we sign off? Um, well, one, I want to thank you, Keith, for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and, and again, you and I go back a ways anyway, so it's just like kind of us having a conversation with just, you know, onlookers uh, uh, coming in. But the one thing I would like to the one thing I would like to leave uh, viewers with is that the metal halides and the LEDs and all these things that we talked about, too, um, we do produce those right here in the U.S. And we're very proud of that. So sometimes people don't understand, hey, you know, why can I buy this bar for this? Well, that bar is made in China. And because we produce our stuff in the U.S., unfortunately, as you know, with workers' comp and insurance and just just doing business in the United States, uh, it costs more to produce the stuff. But we do that purposefully to maintain the quality. Gotcha. All right, Tulio, man. Thanks again. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I think everybody else really appreciated the um, your insight tonight. And I just want to remind everybody, that uh, next Thursday, coming back with another Wrapping with Reef Bomb at uh, 7 p.m. My guest is going to be Vinny Altamirano from GHL. So we'll, uh, we'll, have, oh, we'll awesome. have Vinny on. Make sure to say hi to Vinny for me. We will. Yeah. All right, Tulio. Thanks, man. Hey, good night, everybody. Signing off till next good time. Good night, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Thanks, folks.